this week on InCycle. As the Tour de France approaches, we're at the Dutch Championships to see the importance of wearing national colours. I've never won it before, only second and third. And now, being a pro rider, I've won it. So you forget all the other years. Really, a boyhood dream come true. Ahead of the sprints at the Tour, there's Michael Matthews on taking on the best in the business. Yeah, it's definitely intimidating going to going to a Tour de France, trying to sprint against a guy like Kittle or Grapple when they're four times the size of me. But um, yeah, you have to try. We also have a look at how the Dauphiné serves as a preview to the Tour de France. I think it's a good indication, but far from a fail-safe indicator. And, you know, there are good indicators all around the calendar, really. You've had times where people have gone too well in the Dauphiné and, and expended too much energy and paid for it later in the Tour de France. But first, Mark Renshaw on leading out one of the fastest men in cycling. It's a, sp a specialised role, you know, reading the sprinter, knowing exactly where he wants to be. Uh, putting him in a position to win. Everybody in the, in the peloton respects him so much that you can absolutely rely on him, that you know exactly what, what he will do and literally will never fail. It's all about judging that distance from the finish to be perfection that you set Cav up for maybe eight or ten seconds of sprinting. And the most important is the positioning. If he's a little bit boxed in or if he's not able to get out and start his sprint, then you know, that's, that's the worst off situation you can be in because you really want him to be able to show his capabilities. Any great lead-out man needs a finisher of equal quality, and Mark Renshaw has arguably the best. I've known him quite a long time, spent you know, countless nights in a hotel room with him. He thinks of himself as a bit of a comedian, so sometimes you've got to laugh along with him. But we also, you know, we have to have a professional relationship in, in cycling, so he expects the most from me. Uh, likewise, I expect the most from him. We're in Tour of Croatia that we had a, quite a tricky finish in stage two, and we knew that we had to come into those corners first and second if there were any chance at winning. It's, it's not simple just to turn up in the right position, you need a good team and I was lucky that he put me in the right position and I could go from there and, uh, and set the victory up for Cav. They separated so Renshaw had the chance to, to sprint for himself and also realising the difficulties and I think that is important to understand you know, what the sprinter feels in terms of pressure, what a sprinter feels in terms of failing and not achieving what everybody expects him to achieve after working the whole day. And that probably made him even a, a better lead-out man when they, when they came back and, and hooked up together again. After a couple of seasons apart, Renshaw and Cavendish were reunited at the Mega Farmer Quick Step before completing a surprise move to Dimension Data this year. Stepping up to World Tour was probably you know, the biggest uh, step that they took this year and then signing riders like myself, Cavendish and Eisel. We've already won quite a few races and I'm enjoying being back with uh, Boson Hagen also. And it's not only riders who've moved with Cavendish, as head of performance Rolf Aldag also made the switch. However, inspirational sports director Brian Holm did stay with Etix Quickstep and its incoming star, Marcel Kittel. One of the best directors in the peloton and it's a shame that Brian couldn't come across with us to Dimension Data. Uh, it would have been nice to have him here because obviously he knows Cavendish so well. Uh, he, you know, he can play those little roles in, in his mind and, and you know, turn him into that extra 5-10%. But on the other hand, uh, we signed uh, Roger Hammond who you know, is also a good friend of Cavendish and knows him quite well and we've seen that this year he's been really successful. This year is a bit different than usual for the dynamic duo. With the Olympics in Rio coming up, 2016 has seen a different approach for Cavendish. It's been a little bit up and down this season so far. We've you know, crossed paths quite a lot, uh, Cavendish and I, because he's, he's got other objectives this year on the track. 
So um, at the moment we've rode with a lot of different guys. Uh, it's mainly about teaching them how, how to do the lead out. To win with a team is also very special because uh, it's so hard to do this day and age in cycling. And perhaps there's no better man to learn from than one who sacrificed his chances for personal glory. It's one of these very, very few sports where you really, really have to hurt yourself for somebody else's success. And it's, there's no cover-up, so if you're not there, people will see it. You know, I dedicate everything to uh, the guy behind me and, you know, some guys say, well, why don't you win? There's always a part uh, within you that would like to win. Um, you know, I'd, yeah, I'd love to win a race for my little boy and tell him that I won, but instead I have to tell him that the team won. Time now for our news and an update on the World Tour rankings ahead of the Tour de France. Slovakian Petr Sagan will be taking his World Champions jersey to the Tour at the top of the UCI World rankings. Alejandro Valverde holds on to second spot and stage race stars Alberto Contador and Naido Quintana are in third and fourth position respectively. With the 2016 Tour de France just days away, the teams are putting in the final touches to a vigorous preparation regime. For many, the Dauphiné, which took place earlier this month, is a crucial step to ensuring riders are ready and raring to go for cycling's biggest race. The Dauphiné has always been the key test before the Tour de France. This is really just a last kind of test on, in a racing environment. I think the answer for most riders about how well they're going and where they are in terms of their preparation will come from the results this week. For us it's um, an important running into the Tour, so we've got this uh, French race <laughs> um, who uh, is a little bit like a mini Tour de France. You have got some uh, half stages, some mountain stages, you've got also a high level of, uh, of the GC Contender and you get this feeling about the Tour that is fever. The eight-day race is a warm-up, testing legs and the same routes that they may use at the Tour de France. You get a lot of the main tour contenders that come here uh, to test their legs, gauge form against uh, some of their rivals. Racing's equally an important part of training. The race is, as I said, like it allows them to test themselves in a race environment and all the things that are a part of that. Main benefit of this race, I guess, is that it is in France, so teams also have the opportunity to do a bit of recon while they're here and become familiar with the roads and the crowd and other elements that are also impact racing on tour. It's in France, it's organised by ASO. On the last, over the last few years, we've seen a number of occasions where Dauphiné has gone to specific finishes which the Tour will then use. In some cases, for some riders, it's a question of coming to France and getting used to French roads, getting used to um, some of the roads they're going to be riding on in the Tour de France in July. And if recent years are anything to go by, the Dauphiné can give a good idea of who may be in yellow on the Champs-Élysées, with both Brad Wiggins and Chris Froome completing the Dauphiné Tour double. Riders that finish in the top five, top ten here, um, are the main guys you're going to be looking at at the Tour. In previous years, it's always been a fairly strong indicator if you're going well at the Dauphiné, you're going to go well at the Tour de France. Team Sky has had a stranglehold on this race, I think, for like the last four or five years, and pretty much had a stranglehold on the Tour for about the same amount of time. So that tells you something. Of course, it's nice to try to win because you get the confidence for the, the full team stuff and uh, you get out of the Dauphiné with, yeah, full of um, an advantage psychologic on the other order of the contender. We use the Dauphiné to be good and do the last uh, workload and you know like some intensity and then it's just resting do some good training and be mentally ready for the tour also the team also target is the race because there's something we we like we won from the last couple of years but despite team sky's dominance over the dauphine in recent years there's not always a direct link between the race and the tour in the last few years you've seen you know bradley wiggins chris broom two out of the three last few years you know, winning winning here and then going on to have success in the Tour de France, but it's, it's, there's no real master, master plan or blueprint to it. I think the Dauphiné just gives you a barometer of where you are in terms of tour, tour progression. I think it's a good indication, but far from a fail-safe indicator. 
and you know there are good indicators all around the calendar really. You've had times where people have gone too well in the Dauphiné and, and expended too much energy and paid for it later in the Tour de France. I don't necessarily think you can count someone out if they don't do well this week. Um, on the other hand, as I said before, if someone wins here that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be really good in the Tour de France because it's a long time between the start of the Dauphiné certainly and the end of the Tour de France. So whilst the Dauphiné may not be able to give a definitive answer on who will win the Tour de France, it certainly helps to decide who will be at Mont Saint-Michel on the 2nd of July. It's a, it's a good chance to, to bring all the, some key riders. Every day we think about you know, stage after stage, how the guys they did, how they are mentally, physically, I mean, so we keep we pick up all the small um, small information, the marginal gain we call it. It helps to finalize the selections for the two. You get a proper good feeling, you know, proper good feedback how the guys they are um, physically and uh, how much they need to do to be perfect before the two or you know, if they need the rest or not, some training. So here's a proper good test for us, yeah. And with Chris Froome claiming his third Dauphiné win this year, Team Sky will be hoping their main man can deliver his third Tour de France title. I think um, the perception of the name Bling is a little bit different to the, the way I take it. It doesn't really mean all the big fancy things, going to casinos and all this stuff. To me it just it means I like nice things, but it's not over the top and I think um, my personality is a little bit different to I think a lot of people know. I'm not a self-centered person or anything, I just en really enjoy like, riding the bike and that's the reason I do it uh, professionally is because I love it so much. Michael Bling Matthews is a man keen to let his racing do the talking. Now age 25, he's stepping out of the shadow of the nickname. But having favourite status at the biggest races has proved a mixed experience so far, as witnessed at this year's Milan San Remo. With all the preparation that went into that race, it was countless amount of hours. Um, specific training too. It was definitely difficult to, to get my head back on my shoulders after that because I was the biggest favourite for the race. When you're the biggest favourite, all the pressure's on you and everyone's looking at you. Despite the early season disappointment, Matthews is someone everyone in the peloton is watching. With a sprint that's already delivered him stage wins at the Giro and strong showings at Amstel Gold, Matthews' skill set draws comparisons to one man, the current world champion, Peter Sagan. Obviously, Sagan's a very, very special rider. He um, he doesn't really have many downfalls, so it's quite it's quite hard to beat him at a lot of times. And um, yeah, our similarities are a lot alike because we're, we're two both punchy riders and exciting riders. We both love to race. We both love riding our bikes. We're both really into mountain biking, cross bike, everything motocross. It's definitely going to be exciting next few years for cycling. Hopefully, if we keep um, if we keep progressing in this direction. The rivalry is still a fledgling one, but it could be set to intensify. Up until now, Matthews has largely shunned riding the cobbled classics, but that could soon all change. It's definitely something you can't just go there and say, oh, I'm going to win Flanders. It's, you've got to be there in the off-season, training on the course, figuring out where all the corners are, where, where the times you have to be at the front, where you can relax. And um, I think maybe I'll do a bit of that this off-season to, to get a bit of practice on the course and then I'll really know how I'm going to go in the race. But I was second in the under-23 Flanders, but it's a totally different race in the pros. So you can't say I'm going to go and win Flanders in the next two years when you're not really sure. But um, yeah, hopefully I can be there and hopefully me and Sagan can have a really good battle because um, I think it would be, it'd be really cool to watch. For now, there's the small matter of 21 days in France. Matthew's first time at the Tour de France last year was a memorable one, and for very painful reasons. Still, it was a race that hardened up the man from Canberra. Every, every single day, there was not really a second where I was like, OK, I can keep going, I'm, I'm getting better. It was just getting worse and worse. And especially when I found out I actually had four broken ribs, that was probably the hardest part. Um, of, of the whole race. That was probably three days after the actual crash. I definitely didn't think I was going to get to Paris and the emotional feelings of getting to Paris was, was pretty special. With the struggle of 2015 behind him, Matthews comes into this tour in a relaxed mood. 
With stage profiles suited to his style of racing, the buzz around his chances of winning a stage is good. What's more, Matthews could just be the man to end Sagan's four-year green jersey dominance. Normally with the Tour de France, with our team, we sort of share up the role a little bit and maybe if if we're sharing up the roles, it's really quite hard to go for the green jersey because if, if you're helping your teammate out one stage and Sagan gets a top five or a top ten, he's already that, that much further in front. So, yeah, I think um, we just have to see how it goes. We're fortunate this year for me and Sagan that um, there's a lot of uphill, up, slight uphill finishes. So they're not, there's not too many actual flat sprints this year. So I think there's only maybe two or three or four flat sprints. Um, and then the rest to have an uphill and a finish. And um, so that's, that's definitely going to help guys like me and Sagan to try and get more, more stage wins. Yeah, it's definitely intimidating going to, going to a Tour de France, trying to sprint against a guy like Kittle or Greipel when they're four times the size of me. But um, yeah, you have to try. Anything can happen in a, in a finish of the Tour de France like you've seen for how many years now. It's not always the biggest and strongest guy that wins all the stages. Many jerseys in cycling, few are as coveted as the national championship jerseys. Every rider dreams of wearing their country's colours, and for the lucky few that do, it's a great source of pride. It's very special and a big honour. I think everybody has different experiences, but for me, the first time I became national champion was a childhood dream come true. It came at a later stage in my career, so I had to be patient, and I fought hard for it. Once you do win, you're very visible in that red, white and blue jersey. Especially if you're a rider like me, who rides in the service of others, what you do in the race isn't that clear to everyone. But then they can see what you do for others. They see that you're riding hard for your main guy, getting water bottles, keeping your captain in front. And so you become far more visible. And that's one of the advantages of wearing that red, white and blue jersey. And having won the national championships twice as a rider, Murenhout has also done so as sports director, helping Inguska Costa to victory at this year's women's Dutch nationals. Yes, it's very different. The race is fantastic. But I have to say, yesterday we won the nationals with the women's team, with Anuska Costa. And the happiness in the car was huge, because it was really exciting all the way to the finish line. It was a very convincing sprint from her, but we couldn't see that in the car, of course. To have someone in your team win it is so exciting. You're working with those women really hard, and if they finish it off like that, then it's a good job for me as well. And I can only be proud of the way they did it. I think the value of that red, white and blue jersey is fully understood by the women too. It's very much alive with them. The Nationals is also a race that ends the first half of the season. And after this, we go to the Giro d'Italia for women. But a title is a title, and they can never take that away from you. I think that when a team arrives here and sees the parkour, sees the VIP tents, and sees the barriers, that the anticipation really starts to build. I think it was a great men's race, and the women's race was spectacular to watch as well. Not because we won. No, it was really an attractive race. And I don't think we have to convince any women that started here of the value of that red, white and blue. I think the same as everyone. I think this is something really special. That's why a championship is so special, because you can ride a whole year in that jersey. That is also the reason that everyone that starts here is highly motivated. It's a different race than normal, with other riders than normal. But that doesn't mean it's going to be easier than normal or less special. Everybody is going for it, and me as well. That's the first thing, that you have something different than the others. Besides that, I'm a Dutch guy, and this is the highest you can reach as a Dutchman. So this is something unique, and if you win, you can call yourself the best rider in Holland for a whole year, 
so that is great. Today is your chance to show that you are the best of Holland. And that is why it's so special. These are special races. Not to be here with your own team. But you can earn the national title here. That's what every rider would love to do. So it's really important. You ride in it the whole year, so yes, very special. I have never won it in my pro career, but at under 23, I was national champion. So you are the best of your country. There are a lot of good riders here, so wearing that jersey gives you a special feeling for sure. At this year's national championships, with the jersey on the line and the Tour de France just around the corner, all eyes were focused on the top spot of the podium. When I was a child, I saw that jersey in the Tour de France, and I really looked forward to spotting it in the peloton. So it would be great to have this jersey back in the Tour again this year, hopefully around my shoulders, of course. But you can see how flat it is here. So, for me as a climber, that is different. In the early days, when you went to the Tour, the national championships were in Mersenne. That's where I had a shot. But today, there is still a jersey to be won, and I think that everybody wants to win this jersey today. And the emotion of winning was clear to see on the face of the 2016 Dutch national champion Dylan Grunewagen as he beat Walter Wippert by inches in a sprint to claim the title. The new national champion is now keen to show off his new jersey on his Tour de France day. Yes, absolutely. I rode my bike since Cat 1, so for many years already. I have never won it before, only second and third. And now, being a pro rider, I've won it. So you forget all the other years. Really, a childhood dream come true. I hope to do it with a stage win, but I absolutely understand that it's not going to be easy. I go on the tour mainly to learn, and I'm going to do my best. Who knows if something nice will come of it. That's all for this week. Join us next time, but until then, keep up to date with us on social media.